This hour has seven days. Again. Hi, I'm Wendy Mesley. One of the advantages of going back in time is seeing how the future looked. Seems in January of 1966, the age of being frozen and brought back to life was not too far off. Freeze, wait, reanimate is something out of Austin Powers. Also in the seven days, a new president pledges to eliminate corruption in his government. His name is Ferdinand Marcos. Seven days of courting here and yon. Pearson vamps Nigeria and Dean Rusk hugs Saigon. Kosigan woos New Delhi and Joe Green Saskatchewan. It's love in bloom and seven days is on. This hour has seven days and these stories. It would be preferable, just as far as, as scientific evidence goes, to prepare the person for freezing before death. It's very embarrassing to get all dressed up and to go to the dance alone. Um, this puts a considerable burden on all the husbands there who have to dance with you while their wives. It spoils their party. They have to sit there and pretend they're enjoying it. I'm not particularly anxious to have someone else fight to the last drop of my blood. Well, I can tell you that I can uh, fire the uh, highest ranking commanders in the armed forces of the Philippines, and I'm going to do it if they do not uh, rise up to the occasion. I say life's a gamble. The great dealer up stairs in the sky is dealing the cards. One day you and I got an ace, the next day we got a deuce. Good evening, I'm Patrick Watson. And I'm Laurie Lapierre. This is... Dinah Christie, puzzled tonight by what's happening to a dog named Belle. She was quick frozen a few weeks ago by a new service club in Washington. The club is called the Freeze, Wait, Reanimate Society, and the service is cold storage for dogs or people until the scientists of the future learn how to bring them back to life. Ev Cooper, founder and president of the society, is an amateur student of cryobiology, a study of life at very low temperatures. In Washington, Peter Pearson asked Mr. Cooper how he planned to keep his cool for another hundred years. Mr. Cooper, last week you killed a dog. Why? That uh, uh, question sounds pretty ferocious. I think that uh, we'd prefer to say that the dog was put into suspended animation or the best job that we could do to put the dog into suspended animation. Perhaps as you know... But can you bring it back to life? We can't, but we hope that in the future, future scientists will be able to. So the dog is dead? The dog is dead just like a patient is dead on the operating table when uh, uh, the doctor has an open-heart uh, operation or when hypothermia is being used. You want to freeze dead people? No, uh, it would be preferable, just as far as, as scientific evidence goes, to prepare the person for freezing before death. Now, it's true that as you lower the temperature down uh, close to, and towards zero, eventually that heart is going to stop. So a person, in one definition of the word of death, can't be frozen until the heart stops and the breathing stops, so he is clinically dead, just like the dog mm -hmm. is clinically dead, you see. But that doesn't mean that if you're clinically dead, you may not be able to come back from this condition, because there's lots of instances where this has been done. But you, you, you would freeze a corpse before it died or after it died? Freeze a corpse before it died? Well, <laughs> that's a thought. Uh, let's see. Uh, we'd, we'd prefer... Uh, just as I say, to uh, uh, 
catch the person in the terminal stages of illness and be well prepared for him in a hospital under scientific control, as, as good a control as is possible, and then start the whole operation. W would that answer it? Would you be willing to uh, donate your body to this sort of thing? Oh, yes, I have. Right away? Well, no, I'm going to live out this life like I would expect everyone else to live out their lives do before have, they try this type of thing. But do you have enough faith in the process that you'd be willing to go into this thing right away? Oh, absolutely not. This, Why not? This is, uh, this is a desperation uh, type of thing. This is only when all hope of present life is, le is, is gone, and uh, it's merely a better alternative instead of the grave or the furnace. I could ask you, do you think there's any chance if you go into the grave or into the furnace that you're going to come back here on Earth in the future at some time? Now, I don't know if there's going to be any chance for freezing. I just think it's the best chance I have. If you were going to put me on ice tomorrow, how long do you think I'd have to wait until I woke up again? Mm, awfully hard. Um, all I could do is just guess. Let's say 100 years. 100 years. Let's, so I'd wake up in it. 2066. Is there any evidence you have at all that there's any possibility that, that uh, I could be reanimated in 100 years? Yes. I, I would hope so. Now, we do have to rely on the future. Uh, they have to solve the population problem, probably before they'll bring back people from the frozen condition. But there is some pretty good evidence right now. Primarily, I think it comes from Japan. A uh, brain of a cat has been frozen for six and a half months at deep freeze temperatures, and uh, the cat did not get up. It was reanimated. It did not get up and run around. But uh, they did uh, have a good EEG from the cat brain. Where do you think you could get candidates for your freezer? We have um, 408 uh, LES members and subscribers as of yesterday. Uh, perhaps a good number of these people have uh, signed out uh, freeze cards indicating that if death comes to them or if death is definitely threatened immediately and they know they're going to die, uh, they would do their best that they can to become, become frozen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Um, I think uh, there, there could be other people, lots of other people who haven't joined LES that would think that this is a better uh, chance than the grave or the furnace. Well, Mr. Cooper and the members of his society are not the only people who have high hopes for low temperatures. Last year, Professor R.C.W. Ettinger published a book called The Prospect of Immortality, in which he made a medical case for freeze now and thaw later. There are already companies forming in the United States that intend to freeze people for a fee. The price they're asking now is $50,000. But the promoters expect to move into a more popular price range later. Unless you're one of the 7,000 people who have bought a copy of this book in the last few weeks, chances are you've never heard of this book called The Squeaking Wheel. You've uh, never heard of the author either, John Mercer, because he's just a name made up to hide the real names of the two men who wrote the book. They're English-speaking Montrealers who say they're fed up uh, with the French Canadians. Their book has had an interesting history for most of the reputable Canadian publishing houses turned the manuscript down so the two authors published it themselves. They sent out 70 copies for review, but in all Canada, only the Toronto Star and the Monster Prairie Messenger reviewed it. But people have been buying it. They may be the same people who have been writing us with comments like, I'm tired of hearing about Quebec's problem, or this is one country, live it alone. Whatever you think of people like this, there is no doubt that there are enough of them to make this underground book a bestseller. They're obviously ready for a book that makes jokes like, What's, what is the definition of a dope ring? Ten Frenchmen sitting around in a circle. If this makes you wonder about the uh, anonymous authors, it made us wonder too, and so we invited them in our studios. Gentlemen, I trust that you feel as exquisitely silly in those hoods as you look. I wonder why in the world you think you really have to wear them. Well, uh, that brings up the whole question of why we want uh, anonymity in this uh, book. Exactly. Now, the way I feel about it is... Uh, a lot of people have criticized us for not naming ourselves in, uh, as authors of this book. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm not particularly anxious to have someone else fight to the last drop of my blood. 
and... So are you talking literally, you're talking metaphorically? No, literally. You, you're because really af physically afraid that the book might cause some... Well, there are people who can get, at this particular point in our history, in, our, in the era in which we live, people who take offense very easily. And one of the, the ways of expressing this offense is, is by uh, taking retaliatory measures. Now, I'm not literally afraid of having a house bombed, although the house not too far away from mine uh, had that happen to it a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, really, just in order to live our own lives relatively peacefully and without too much interruption and, and uh, disturbance. And besides, we have jobs to do and jobs which we like and which we carry out uh, quite uh, pleasantly and cheerfully at home. And uh, also, as someone remarked, at least uh, if we're wearing this garb, uh, nobody can accuse us of being barefaced liars. The Quebec government, a number of factions in Quebec, can express and indeed carry out legislation which will be damaging to the province as a whole. It certainly will be damaging to the English-speaking members of the province who have lived in it for a number of years and who have a place there and have a right to be there. And we feel that somebody someday had to stand up and say, look, this is as far as we're going. Yeah, but damn it, the somebody didn't stand up and, and say it. He hid behind a lamppost and belled it out like this. You're darn right he did, because if he came out from behind the lamppost, he would get some of the people who are in jail right now, that type of person, coming out and setting fire to homes and causing damage. And we would also, as I explained before, be in some considerable jeopardy with the institutions that we represent. You said <coughs> that, that uh, ing bilingual people of uh, Anglophone background are now refraining from speaking the French, which they could speak if they wished to, in reaction to this sense of pressure. Well, here again, we must be very subjective, but... Are you talking about yourselves? Well, yes, in this are particular case, bilingual? I am. I find that I talk considerably less French than I did before the French Canadian became more militant in the province. I know a number of bilingual English, predominantly English people who speak English now in defiance, if you will, because they feel a growing sense of irritation. You see, the Anglo-Saxon, in my view, is a person who can be led, but not pushed, not told, not commanded. All right, gentlemen, who is suffering as a result of the épanouissement of the French Canadian? Uh, we anticipate, and we can see, in fact, coming right now, a, a trend where the younger person is going to suffer because, for economic reasons, for reasons of self-interest, uh, any large concern, be it a bank, be it a, a telephone company, it doesn't matter what, what it is, uh, needs in the province of Quebec to go through the motions, at least, of, of being terribly, terribly bicultural and bilingual. Now, this may mean that if there are certain positions open and you have several candidates for the job that almost automatically the, the French Canadian candidate even though let's say both may be bilingual the French Canadian candidate is more likely to get it I think that this is happening now and I think that uh, this is an inevitable thing and I think what is the reaction uh, on the part of the uh, English speaking young people will be uh, to, to leave the province ladies and gentlemen the authors may think what they like about their book but it seems to me that there is not much difference between writing anonymous books and writing anonymous letters. Our reporter Jack Webster flew to the Philippines for a look at one of the troubled democracies of Southeast Asia. He arrived just as a crusading new president, Ferdinand Marcus, made his inaugural speech. We must therefore immediately remove this climate of criminality which will result in the deterioration of government itself. <laughs> we must immediately reinstate the supremacy of the law and I shall utilize all the powers of the presidency for this purpose. Marcus admits that he begins with a government system 
gripped in the iron hand of bribery and venality, with wasted resources, lazy civil servants, mostly political appointees, a demoralized army, hungry people living in hovels, and a barren treasury. Marcus's predecessor, Dios Dada Magapagal, actually gave away tens of millions of pesos in cut price food to buy last minute votes. Now I saw signboards in Manila showing Magapagal saying he'd rather go to jail for stealing than see his people go hungry. But the payola didn't work, partly because of the unwilling part played in the campaign by an American who later tried to become an immigrant to Canada. The American was Harry Stonehill, a sometimes US Army lieutenant who discovered that in post-war Manila, everybody had his price. Stonehill built a $50 million industrial empire on that principle and is said to have smuggled some $30 million out when he was deported in 1962 by his erstwhile friend, President Micah Pagal. Stonehill came to Canada and lobbied extensively in Ottawa to be allowed to stay here despite his reputation in the Philippines. His public relations man here, Al Williamson, went to jail for forging Premier Bennett's signature to the now famous Dear Hal letter in which help was sought from Mr. Pearson's office for Stonehill. Stonehill, he's now in California. But while he was fighting to stay in Canada, he several times said he had paid graft in the Philippines. And Marcus used these statements to bring down Magapagal. Do you think you can uh, survive against the massive weight of Red China and its infiltration in this part of the world? Alone, no. With our allies, yes. You said that you were taking over a government gripped in the iron hand of venality with a barren treasury, a slothful civil service, and demoralized armed forces. How, sir, in this first modern republic in Asia, could this have come about? It came about uh, because of uh, the uh, failure of uh, leadership, I'm afraid, and partially uh, due also to uh, the um, effects of the last war. The uh, last war eroded uh, the uh, moral scruples of our people. And uh, because our people fought the uh, invaders, utilizing the same weapons that the invaders were utilizing against us, including deceit, and uh, trickery, sabotage uh, meant the uh, employment of all of these. I was told once, sir, uh, by a prominent former citizen of the Philippines, his name was Harry Stonehill, he told me once, sir, uh, on this television program, that to do business in the Philippines, one had to pay graft. Was that correct in the past? In the past, yes, but uh, I would suggest that nobody tries to do it under my administration. In other words, I immediately sent him to jail. No one will be doing this in the future? No, I uh, can assure you of that. What some, about... Some may try, but uh, as I said, they will immediately meet with the full power of the presidency. Do you intend to uh, take retroactive action against any people who have made fortunes Stonehill, for instance, is said still to be controlling a vast empire in the Philippines. Do you intend to take action against his interests in this country? I will not tolerate uh, any violation of the law, and whether the violation was committed in the past or in the present. Do you have the power to act independently of Congress to say, take whatever steps you wish to fire people, to clean up police departments, and to stop the smuggling? Well, I can tell you that I can uh, fire the uh, highest ranking commanders in the armed forces of the Philippines, and I'm going to do it. If they do not uh, rise up to the occasion, we are reorganizing right now. I'd like to tell you that uh, the um, National Police here, the Philippine Constabulary, is being reorganized. By uh, this time, I think the orders are out for the commanding general to be relieved and somebody else. Uh, only a colonel to take his place. His own commanders are uh, going to be changed. The um, unit commanders are going to be changed. The provincial commanders are going to be changed. Those who have failed in their task of um, preserving uh, peace and uh, maintaining order 
and those who uh, do not uh, seem to be able to meet this new threat, not only to our economy, but to our security. One of the problems, I believe, sir, in detail is that your, your election campaigns last for a full whole year. Yes, is that not uh, so, sir? Horrendous, isn't it? <laughs> I uh, feel that uh, that should be shortened to, well, not more than six months. Have you been seeing the ads in the big magazines lately? Well, they've gone just about as far as they can go. In the past year, they've induced us to spend $300 million on our hair and over half a billion on cosmetics. You want to see how they do it? Does she? Or doesn't she? Well, she does. <laughs> Well, it's pretty hard to tell these days. I would say she does. And I don't know. I know nothing about those kind of girls. Is that an actress? <laughs> ribbons for bravery under clothes. French ribbons for bravery over nothing. A brazier. <laughs> oh, boy, what do I see? <laughs> People around. <laughs> She's a naked chic woman, I suppose. I'm just a girl who can't say no. I'm in a terrible fix. <laughs> intimate? Well, then get intimate without being shy. <laughs> no, I can't tell you. Piping rock, obviously. <laughs> him? Uh, was it him or he's piping? What's a piping rock? <laughs> oh, after shave lotion. Well, yes, I think it was a uh, her. <laughs> Wouldn't you think that was a her?
When Parliament meets on Tuesday, we will have a new minister presiding over the official culture of Canada. The Honourable Judy LaMarche, Minister of Health and Welfare in the last government, becomes Secretary of State in this one. A few years ago, she was a rising young lawyer in Niagara Falls. Now she is the only national arbiter of the arts that Canada has. The minister responsible for the film board, the National Gallery, and, come to think of it, the CBC. The other night, Ms. Lamarche joined Patrick and me at the Seven Days Roundtable in Ottawa. Ms. Lamarche, now that you're no longer responsible for the health of the nation, have you started smoking again? No. I haven't. Tempted? Uh, oh, I thought about it, particularly as an aid to taking off weight. Uh, but the arguments uh, for getting it in the first place still obtain. I didn't think it would be very fair to the people that worked for me in the health department and still are working on this program if I did that. Now, come clean. Did you ever at any time find that you absolutely had to sneak into the washroom and have a cigarette during that, you know, no, the absence? No, but I, I had one of those little cigars a couple of times. Mm -hmm. a, a conservative sender offered me some, and uh, I found that... Uh, they look much nicer when someone else is smoking than they taste when you smoke yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find out uh, a little bit about the things that do interest you, though, and the way that Canadians talk to each other and show each other to each other. What about television? Do you watch television? Um, on occasion. I shall watch it more often now, since I have a television in, in my office and the responsibility to watch it. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy it's, it? Uh, well, sometimes. What do you like? And sometimes, like every other viewer, I get pretty angry about it. I like lots of things on it. I, I don't... Uh, Do you watch Bonanza? Yes. Country music shows? No. Um, hockey? Festival? Hockey? Well, I knit to hockey. <laughs> That's yeah. one thing to do. Do you watch Festival? No, not recently. It's our seven days. Yes. Oh, one of the ones that makes you angry sometimes? Oh, yes, but they often... God, uh, I'm angry. Show. Would you say that you... Um, and, and in my own constituency, Mm -hmm. I have more often watched uh, American stations, I'll be very frank. Um, Let's talk about that. Because uh, I have a color television, which I bought five or six years ago, and, mm -hmm. and uh, up till now, CBC hasn't telecast. And I I'm, was one of the people who uh, my predecessor recommended it, was urged very strongly that mm -hmm. CBC get into the field. Well, there's a lot of... Uh, sorry. Well, this brings us right into uh, the major difference between television in this country and television yes. in the United States. Of course, we have a public, <coughs> a public television system. What, what do you think uh, are the virtues of a public television system, if any? Well, I think uh, you can be far more experimental and you can produce a number of things that uh, uh, in a system which is uh, purely based on support from advertisers, you can't do. Um, I would imagine that there'd be a lot of advertisers who'd be afraid to touch this program, for, for instance. You couldn't be nearly as controversial. You couldn't produce bad taste as well as good taste, as I, I think you'll agree you have on occasion, uh, if you had an advertiser and you'd have them screaming down your neck the moment you left the mm -hmm. screen. And uh, I think you have to have that opportunity to be experimental. I can get mad at you, but I don't know, next minute I may enjoy what you're doing. But you know, it's not just advertisers. I, there's plenty of evidence that controversy really stirs up you guys in Parliament. Yes. The, the politicians are amongst the first to scream when there's something Some. that's mm -hmm. truly controversial. But and they're uh, trying to do what I wouldn't try to do. They're trying to impose their taste on the national system. A sort of form of censorship. Well, I don't really think they see taste. it that way. Yeah, yeah. But isn't there kind of an essential um, conflict in a public broadcasting organization that's supported by Parliament and yet deems that a central part of its role is to criticize that very Parliament. Doesn't that raise a conflict that's awfully difficult to deal with, especially if you're a politician that's being criticized? Yes, well, of course, this is uh, something politicians don't understand. Why anyone in CBC should think it's a central role to criticize Parliament? Do you understand it? members. Yes, and do you accept it? Do I accept that, that this is the reason? That one of the, no, that that this one is of the role of the CBC is to criticize the institution and the people who make it up, an institution called Parliament? Well, I think uh, to comment on it, and if necessary to criticize, yes, but uh, not to erect itself into the opposition. Isn't it awfully unlikely that the government is, that this government is going to do anything much about broadcasting? It's a minority government. It has an enormous backlog of bills that have been hanging around for, what, two, three years, some of them, I suppose. Uh, broadcasting legislation is a real Pandora's box, isn't it? It's a mm -hmm. real can of worms. It's going to stir up the mud in this country a, a tremendous amount. It, I guess if I were 
heading a minority government, it's not a piece of aggra aggravation that I'd particularly want to get into if I didn't have to. It, well, the people of the country keep, to, keep electing minority governments, and they seem to like it. <laughs> I didn't suggest to you that we were going to have broadcasting legislation this year or resolve the question. There are so many new technical developments coming along, and the advent of color, for instance, would be so expensive, the proliferation of second stations, and I suppose it'd be applications for third and fourth. All these things are, are things which I think we ought to take our time about, and so I really can't suggest that it'll be quickly. Let's talk about some of the other things that you're going to have your finger in. Do you, um, do you listen to music? Do you look at paintings? Do you go to the theater? Do you go to movies? One at a time, Patrick. Well, I rarely go to a movie anymore um, because of lack of time. I don't have, uh, haven't had for the last few years since I've been in Parliament the same opportunity to go to theater. I wander into art galleries every time I have the opportunity. More often out of the country than in because I have more time when I'm out of the country. Mm -hmm. I um, uh, am not as fond of live music. You dig the new rock beat? The Beatles and people like sure. this? Well, um, you can hardly escape it on radio. <laughs> <laughs> I really, uh, I really, really like don't. <laughs> Tell me I, I don't prefer it. No, that's, that's not your not kind of beat. No. You don't dig that, Jack? Oh, Seven is not one of your heroes. I read all the books, and I haven't seen the latest movie, but I've seen the others. You like them? Oh, I think it's great sport. Seriously. It's one of the few movies I, I've seen in the last couple of years, too. And what about the image I think of, they're funny. What about the image of women in the Bond yes. movies? Does that concern you at all, or did you just take it as a giggle? I remember the man you had on one night who uh, wrote a book. In of uh, Older Women? Yes. Oh, yes. And the attack the young woman <laughs> launched on him. That would sort of startle me. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I, I don't... Uh, th those women are not women. You know, they're caricatures, just as Bond isn't a man. He's a caricature, too. I don't identify with that, and I'm sure no woman does. Would you like to see... Uh, we all like to look like that, but uh, we don't <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> I know there's been. Would you like to look like Bond? By golly, I hadn't thought about that. I would not be able to handle. Uh, Some of the perquisites would be very nice. All the equipment that he does handle, Speaking including women. Would you uh, reconsider now, after five years of your life in politics, that you might perhaps uh, remain in the bar or done other things? Oh, yes, I think it was a great mistake. Was it? Are you I serious? So. Oh, yes. To go into politics? Yes. Why? Why? For heaven's sake. Oh, um, I think I would be person? person, personally much happier mm -hmm. not in politics. Um, you become a target, you know, in this uh, in politics. Uh, um, you completely lose your privacy, and this is a, a price that no one realizes before it, and uh, no one who hasn't lost his or her privacy has any idea of how high a price it is. Uh, if it's so unpleasant, why don't you? Why? I mean, this yes. isn't a recommendation, but why don't you <laughs> get out? Well, I trapped? often think about it, but there's certain things that you, you uh, want to do, and, you know, you, you get in the, in the course of it, an election comes along, you, um, you run, you have commitments to your constituents and to the people who work for you, mm -hmm. to your party. Um, if I simply said, well, I'd like to go home and practice law, everybody scoff, and they say, you know, what for? Would What's you, the real reason? Would you have entered politics had you been married? Would well, I children? don't know. With know. children? No. I don't know. Do you? I doubt that I would have been nominated. You said uh, once, I think it was one, on one of our programs, that if the right man came along or something, you'd drop politics like that and get married. Still feel like Yeah, well, like this doesn't mean tomorrow. You know. It means filling my obligations and getting out as quickly as I could. When you were in the Department of Health and Welfare, uh, the, you develop a reputation for uh, always being uh, involved into controversy. I'm trying not to use the same phrase I used once in the inquiry. Not, but without <laughs> not likely to lose that reputation Listen, in this area. In, in this well, area. But do you feel that this follows you? You know, oh, yeah. you were difficult to get along with. You, you, uh, you were not diplomatic and so on and so forth. And this this uh, didn't begin there. It began the Truth Squad. Is it, um, is it typecasting? Well, I lost the press there. Yes, is it, it typecasting, typecasting or is it accurate? Do you feel that the, price, the press has a stereotype of Judy LaMarche, which... They, uh, yes, I think, it's a, I think it's indelible now. Now, what do you do about it? Is there anything you I don't can think do? You, can. you are typecast as what? Being violently partisan, being a loudmouth, being... Uh, uh, Undiplomatic, yeah. and now you're... you're, you're uncultured. Uncultured, and, and, uh, and things like this now. But do, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? Except bleeding. 
well, I bleed inside, I hope, mm -hmm. not publicly, but uh, I'm going to do what I did before, is uh, also demonstrate something else, which time proves that you, I can get things done, and do get them done. And uh, I think that I'll just, you know, go my own way and get the things done in this department as well. Last April the 5th, Canada's war on poverty was declared in measured tones during the speech from the throne. Governor General Georges Vanier then stated, my government is developing a program for the elimination of poverty amongst our people. Well, that was last April the 5th, and in due course, a special planning secretariat attached to the Privy Council came into being. In the months since, many Canadians have come to wonder, when does the fighting start in this war on poverty? And when are they going to ask the poor what they think about it all. What I, what I think about his war on poverty is this. He, he does a lot of talking about it, but uh, he, he, does, he hasn't shown any action yet, in my estimation. I mean to say, he does a lot of talking. He's going to do this, he's going to do this, he's going to do that. He never does nothing, right? See, you take Abby Bennett in the, in the 30s, you see what I mean? They had all the men was out of work and all that. What did he do? He did something about it. He formed camps. The job was right, but the pay was wrong. You get the idea? But he had the right idea. Creative imagination it was a thing he possessed, which Mr. Pearson will never possess, because he hasn't got it up here. I say life's a gamble. The great dealer upstairs in the sky is dealing the cards. One day you and I got an ace, the next day we got a deuce. You've been getting a lot of deuces, though, haven't you? Yes, I have. Because this world is sick. This war is sick. It's panic stricken. The poor don't know what he's doing because he can't. Some poor fellow never went to school, never had an education. The only education he has is a big pound of baloney behind a church or something. And he's, he's getting food because naturally he has to have his stomach filled. Well, that's a poor way to do it. I'd say give the man money. I'd say a pension of 35 if he needs it. And if you have money, will they want it for drink? Even if, say, if they have a dollar, they, they want a bottle, they'd rather spend I know for a fact there's, there's a man right in the, our, where I live. He'd rather take the food out of the kid's mouth just to get a bottle of beer or something. So then you would tell the government to do what? To close all the beer parlors, anything, liquor, completely. And this would be the way to end poverty? Yes, most of it. There shouldn't be a man in Canada without something to do. At any time that he's unemployed, he should be able to go to some place and have something to do, not to be given a handout. Who wants the handout? I don't want it, and I don't think any of the other boys want it, but they want something to do with their hands so they can keep their pride and still be uh, doing something instead of, instead of uh, going around getting handouts. Handouts don't get you anywhere. Something to eat doesn't put me on my feet. I want to get a few bucks in my hand and get myself started again so I can go around and make a few more applications for jobs. I've got several applications in now for jobs. But now you take these, uh, when a man gets down that low, he has no money. And uh, he has to go to missions in order to subsist. This is taking a hand of this is This is belittling. This is lowering yourself. And you lose your pride and you lose your self-respect and it gets to the point that you don't care for nothing. This is what creates alcoholics. It's just that they, uh, they've lost all their pride, and uh, they've lost even the uh, courage or the will to get back up out of the rut or the gutter that they're in, see? This is the Ottawa man in charge of Canada's war on poverty, Bob Phillips, the new director of the Special Planning Secretariat. He's questioned by Roy Fabish. The guy that wants something more to eat and more money to spend and better clothes and a better opportunity for his children surely is going to find all this bureaucratic coordination remote from the problems he's faced with in every day. The guy who wants better food, better clothing, better housing for his family and his kids is going to feel an awful lot happier when he achieves these things and achieves them quickly. Not because they were handed out by some do-gooders, but because he himself has, has got them through his own efforts. 
through his own participation as a member of Canadian society. That's easier said than done. You bet it is. And it's, you've got, I would like to hear from you what specific ideas you have that you can share with the poor, how with dignity they can help themselves. I would rather put it that it's what ideas the poor can share with the rest of us. But surely if they've had ideas, they would have done something about it. Ah, oh, but would they have done something? That's the point. Obviously, they have ideas. By and large, they're an intelligent group of people as intelligent, no more, no less, than the rest of us in any other economic cross-section of the population. But nobody's been down there listening, so to speak. They don't tend to write letters to their members of parliament or to their local newspapers or even write into television programs. They're, they're the silenced voice in Canada. Well, I think it's going to be an awful lot better for this country when they are no longer the silenced voice. When they're convinced that people are listening, then they'll talk. That's been proved already. So where do we stand? A couple of things are clear. The new poor, as well as the old, remain with us. And the challenge we face is far more than just economic. We're also up against a state of mind. The idea that the poor are only getting what they deserve. This week, we talked with two young men who are already well on the way to joining the permanent poor. Gary, 17, Cliff, 19. Both are dropouts. For the past three or four years, they've been drifting around Canada, never holding a job more than a few weeks, never at any time very far from the bread line. Are you fellas sorry in any way that you left school? I was after a while. Thank you. I still am. I wish I was back home and everything was the way it was now. But I plan maybe soon I'll settle down. I'll be able to settle down and get myself going tonight to school and learn a trade or something. What happens to you kids when you uh, don't have a job and you run out of money? How do you live then? Well, these are the places I guess you go to, you know. You go to sell your see if you can get a meal ticket somewhere else like that, you know. It's about the only thing you can do or look for casual labor around the city somewhere, you know, you're liable to find a job doing something. I don't like going to these places much. I usually uh, go out in the country and get myself, uh, go on a farm and ask the guy if he'll need some help just for a few dollars, you know. Just take a few dollars and stay there and work for my room and board. So I don't like much going to these places. By these places, what do you mean, Gary? I mean, uh, you know, Good Shepherds or Sally Ann, all the uh, welfare agencies and all that. Well why, why, well, why don't you like going there exactly? I mean, what's wrong with the... Uh... Well, it's just, you get looked at it by everybody, that's all, when you walk down the street. I mean, everybody, when you go there, see, practically everybody looks alike, you know, in a, in a sense, they all wear the same clothes. They all look shabby looking. So I'd rather just stay away from there. And you get depressed uh, or you feel low? Is that, is that yeah. Have you fellas uh, heard about uh, the Right Honorable Lester B. Pearson's Secretariat on Poverty, what is commonly called the War on Poverty? Have you fellas heard anything I've heard about a little of it. It doesn't seem to me that they've done very much since they've started their War on Poverty. What do you say? Uh, well, there hasn't been very much change that I know of, that I've seen. And you, you're still doing the same things going to the same places, most of the guys. Well, what are and, uh, the doing the same things and going to the same places? Can you tell me these things, or can you tell well, me these I places? Mean, they're still only hanging out on the street and getting drunk or trying to look for, for work, and they can't get work, so nobody will give them work. They haven't got the clothes, and uh, they don't look neat, so they don't. nobody will give them a job. That's the only reason they'll stay down there, is because nobody will give them a chance to get out of it. Once you get down there and you get all dirty, okay, you're down there for a couple of months, you're going to have dirty clothes on. After a couple of months, that's for sure. But when you have dirty clothes, you aren't going to get a job, so you won't be able to get any clean clothes. You complained a little earlier about the uh, uh, religion, the doses of religion you get with the help you get. Uh, what exactly happens? I mean, what, what do you mean by that, particularly? You come, you know, you're extra hungry, you know, other ways, you know, you don't get food right away first time. You, I guess a lot of guys get impatient, you know, that's about all, you know. They, they don't like you listening to sing because a lot of it's shoved down their throat all the time, you know, and the guys get sick of it after every night, every night they got to listen to a sermon, you know, before they get something to eat or something like that. And a lot of guys get sick, that's all of it. 
most of these guys don't give a, a hoot about this and that, you know, the religion bit of it, you know. They just come here hungry, got to work, you know, and they, all they want is something to eat because most of them have been walking the streets all day. They're tired. They don't want to listen to the religious bit every night. They don't mind maybe once or twice a week, but every night a little too much sometimes. That's about all I can say, sir. You go down this hall down here on the... I don't know the name of the street is. There's a place down there, and when you go in and eat, you gotta sit there through 45 minutes singing hymns and listening to a guy uh, talk. And nobody listens to him anyway, but you still got, no, they know that nobody's listening to him. I mean, they're all sitting there laughing at him and this and that. And when he, they're singing the hymns, the ones up there are the only ones singing, and yet they're still making them go through it before they get anything to eat. And then when they do give you something to eat, you don't get it practice. Most of the time, you don't get nothing worthwhile going for anyway. It's not edible. next week at the same time for this hour has seven days again tonight